Well, good morning, Dennis. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your very busy schedule to uh, you know spend some time with me on the Meaning Project podcast. Um, honored to have morning. you. Yes, going through you, your CV uh, reads like a, a beautiful military novel. Um, just going <laughs> through it with with great research. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing just day to day, um, helping uh, our, our our active duty military as a as a counseling psychologist? Um, well, right now I'm working with um, anyone, veteran, guard, I'm working at the main VA medical center in White River Junction, Vermont. And so I'm a psychologist and we deal with a lot of PTSD, combat, um, some military sexual trauma, uh, some pre-military trauma. Uh, my main focus is the PTSD um naturally i i get to meet everybody so uh, could be schizophrenics could be bipolar people suffering from those kinds of ailments could be um i just moved here and i don't like the winter it uh, could be um a whole gamut of stuff but the one thing i'm always always strongly doing and in fact i did it today with um, a random guy who's a veteran working in the office over the hallway from me. And that is to really encourage people to advocate for themselves to get as much for the VA disability as they possibly can. Um, because, you know, we serve, we serve for free. Uh, you know, we don't ask for anything back. We get the retirement and, uh, but the VA disability benefits and ability to get into the health care and the dental care and the eyes, et cetera, um, can really make a huge difference. And um, someone going from 90 to 100 percent, that's about two thousand dollars a month mm -hmm. tax free and mm -hmm. plus educational benefits and medical benefits and other stuff for family members. So I'm always encouraging people to do that. And. I find that a lot of the older ones, older veterans have not, just because it was a different time, a different culture, and they were treated differently, say, I'll allude to Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always encouraging them, and if I have to, I'll write letters in support of, et cetera. So, yeah. You make a, you make an interesting point. I know some of the veterans I've had the honor to, to work with and help, um, that older generation, the Vietnam era, really didn't pursue those benefits compared to maybe a, a later generation of desert storm or right. Iraqi freedom. And, and you say it has a lot to do with the culture that they returned home to. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was the huge, um, for lack of better rubric, uh, term hippie movement, you know, and they, that, uh, anti-war movement, a lot of protesting and PTSD wasn't even a recognized diagnosis. Um, and in fact, it was not even in our diagnostic manuals until 1980. And at that point, if someone had had the symptoms for more than six months, then it was considered pre-existing and therefore wasn't considered related to their combat or other traumas. And so they didn't get anything for that. Um, however, the spouses and people lobbied more and more. And in the next, the, the DSM-4, which I don't recall when that came out, it, it became no longer a pre-existing condition after six months, if my memory serves me correctly. And go ahead. Yeah, I was, well, tell me a little bit. You, you've mentioned PTSD. We know I, I've talked a lot about PTSD, especially in our, in our veterans. Um, how do you work with PTSD? What are some of the, the either techniques or, or, or right. theories that you use to help? Sure, absolutely. Um, the, the one thing every veteran that's, that's dealing with PTSD loves to hear is, um, well, you know, avoidance is the great perpetuator. And I think we're trained in our culture, regardless of military or not, to reside in the good and the happy and avoid the bad and the uncomfortable, et cetera. However, the treatment of choice for dealing with any kind of anxiety or PTSD is to do that which you fear. And um, 
that can come in a wide variety of, of uh, methods, if you will. And there's a lot of what we call empirically validated methods. They've been tried, tested, and been quite successful on a variety of clients and under a variety of situations. Um, and I, I personally have been trained in cognitive processing therapy. Um, I've used that with, I don't know how many veterans from a variety of eras. Um, right now, the oldest would be Vietnam. Um, and uh, But we don't always have to dive right into it because I've also worked with clients who couldn't tolerate the exposure, who couldn't tolerate talking about what they considered to be their worst traumatic event that they experienced and would just shut down. Or I had a veteran first session, we're talking, he's a younger guy, um, probably in his 40s at that point. Um, two offices down, they were ha hammering, putting up pictures. He left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he had been in firefights he had you know um no not today sorry but so i would um and another one loved to play golf a vietnam vet he retired loved golf but on the back nine um helicopters medical helicopters would go over civilian ones and that would ruin his game mm -hmm. and he was good he had a good handicap and all and so instead of saying let's talk about the helicopters let's talk about what you see make 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 it a, a a fun thing and and subtly weave in the exposures you know we i would talk about the helicopter in a joking manner you know mm -hmm. so far as his ultimate goal in treatment was to blow a kiss at the helicopter and this is a battle hardened you know grunt from eons gone by and it, he laughed his head off in a in a good way and he actually ended up doing that for fun in front of his buddies you know months later but um he he didn't do any set treatment protocol but was able to weave it in and his nightmares are gone his his he sleeps like a baby and he, naturally he's up to 100 percent now <laughs> that's, that's awesome isn't it amazing what what humor can do for us in oh, treatment my... too bad we can't make that an evidence-based practice absolutely yeah yeah absolutely and you know um there's, there's different kinds of humor of course you know the dark humor of of the veteran and uh which i've had 23 years to hone but then the uh other 25 years before i went in was was finely tuned with monty python and all that other you know 1970s and um mel brooks and all that stuff so yeah if you come into my office you 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 don't think you not you may i warn people <laughs> and um there there may be some offensive stuff coming at you for fun and, of course uh, of course we're, we're usually on the same page though that's awesome well let's let's talk about your your well how you got to your years of service and what your years of service were like i think i i love that story and i'm sure the audience will too so 25 okay. years of, of of monty python um so <laughs> Obviously, growing up over in the UK, correct? Yeah, yeah. I was I was um, born in the UK. Uh, lived about an hour southwest of London. Um, was born in Guildford. So anyone seen in the name of the father Guildford for? Yeah, I remember when that happened. Um, and uh, so doing that, and my mum and I moved over to the states in '86 when I was 17. Um, they were divorced um long before then six seven years before then mm -hmm. and um moved out to california and got into restaurants moved decided to move in with my brother in vermont because i things weren't working out so well for me in california and so i went out to vermont became a baker um, which now, ironically, I have celiac disease, so I can't enjoy the things I love. <laughs> Sorry. It's good for 30%, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, then my wife and I, then girlfriend at the time, um, we combined for 6000 bucks two years in a row in the early 90s, which wasn't that great. And she went out and visited her friend, um, in a, in a you know a little young 
20 something hippie van trip. Um, and he was at Minot Air Force Base, um, three bedroom house on base, no utilities to pay, um, you know, uh, commissary base exchange. And um, then she said, why don't why don't we go one of us go into the Air Force to me when we got back from the trips, so I joined up with them in Seattle and I laughed a lot at that um, because it wasn't kind of on the forefront of my mind. However, it did become a very good idea and I enlisted, um, delayed enlistment program uh, because my particular skill, AFSC, was changing. It was in the midst of a change and it disappeared off the recruiter's radar for a few months. And so I went in as a cook. I had um, with 47 college credits, which gave me the two stripes. So it was an E3 um, and a plan. I got to the first base, which was McDill. And uh, they, they said, what are you doing here? When they looked at my ASVAB scores, they called me a rocket scientist. And I said, I'm a cook and I have a plan. Um, <laughs> and so they they were very nice, very gracious, and they allowed me to do the military advancing courses that we have to do work and my schoolwork at the same time. The deal was that I would uh, quit my school, my university work, if I started failing on my military stuff in any way. And my wonderful wife, Peg, bless her, she's an amazing guidance counselor because she didn't have one, so she became one. And uh, she had her three bachelors and um, masters. And um, so she guided me through. She got a job at the university, and I, I was doing CLEP tests as well, which are you test out of taking a course, mm. take a test, and you get three credits. Um, I ended up doing – I was doing one a week because um, I had a life. And I uh, um, ended up doing 51. So I finished my bachelor's degree. We got there May of 94, finished that December of 95, applied for officer training school. And my and this is while story, you're still at McDill, correct? Still at McDill. Okay. Yeah, still cooking. Um, we'd gone down to Cuba for a few months, made some friends that I'm still in touch with now, thanks to social okay. media now um and did some snorkeling and just supported the refugees um and then i finished my degree and then in summer of 96 i was in san vito which was an old base uh seven kilometers from the adriatic on the heel of the boot mm. that was a terrible may through september southern italy i don't know what could be worse and so mm -hmm. <laughs> I was I was a cook um, for two months, and then I worked in the club and the pizzeria the second two months. So it was rough. <laughs> okay. and we were we were supporting the uh, pre Bosnia special ops, the French, American, and uh, British going in doing their magic, and you know we would um, beg to get on airplanes, but generally I worked a cash register and worked out of the gym. You know, oh, um, yeah, and. That's when I learned that I did get accepted into OTS. Um, but you want me to tell a little bit about how I got? Absolutely. I love the story <laughs> yeah, I think, I think of how you got into general... OTS. How does a right. cook at McDill in uh, what, St. Pete, right? McDill uh, in St. Pete? Well, Tampa. Yeah. Tampa. Yeah. I mean, you can see St. Pete from it. Yeah. How do you go from a cook at McDill Air Force Base to right. officer training school? Okay, so, you know, get the bachelor's degree. I had a 394 GPA that helped. Air Force officer qualifying test scores. I was up in the 90s, 80s, 70s. That helped. Um, and then I had to get five up to five letters of recommendation. Um, one would be from my squadron commander, then his commander, the group commander, then his commander, and it was all men at the time, um, the wing commander, the base commander, and then the senior enlisted troop on the base. So I was able to get those, you know, and the, um, another wonderful thing my wife taught me was if you want to get letters of recommendation, write them a draft. So I Ooh. wrote drafts, we wrote drafts, and we would always um, give them, you know, those blue manila folders with the sleeves. And on one side was 
what I had been doing above my pay grade because I was doing E7 work as an E3 because it was easy and um, and my volunteer stuff. And on the other side was a draft letter of recommendation and one of those old uh, 3.5 floppy disks so that, yeah, they had it electronically as well as hard, um, hard pack, you know. Um, so I managed to get all of those. And then the fifth letter was a freebie. And I, um, this, 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 this really cemented something that is really important in career development, I think. And um, uh, we talked about the positive uncertainty and planned happenstance. Positive uncertainty is basically having essentially a positive attitude when you're faced with uncertainty and ambiguity instead of, oh my God, what am I? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? There's so many things I can do. Say, wow, look at all these choices I have. Right. And, and similar and planned happenstance is literally making good things happen. Um, chance favoring the prepared mind, being aware of what's going on in your surroundings and asking harmless questions like, hey, would you mind if your husband wrote a letter of recommendation for me for after training school? which is what I did um, mm -hmm. the one time when we used to volunteer at Airman's Attic um, and which was co-located with um, relocations back in the VHS tape days. And um, Airman's Attic is where people donate clothes and things for household and junior enlisted could come get them for free, a certain mm -hmm. amount each month. And uh, so I walk out the back and um see the car that's back out there and this is the mid 90s so they the the higher ranks would have their stripes on them or the stars or the eagle to show their rank um on their cars and, on the cars on their personal oh, wow. cars um so people would generally salute them um out of respect excuse me and the license plate on this one was p-e-a-y and i was like okay cool i didn't know who that was, but it was a four-star general. And I was going back to my apartment and um, my wife was still there working away with her friends and in walks Mrs. P, the general's wife. And she says, um, we've never been stationed overseas. I'd like to take my teenage son over to London. Does anyone know anything about this, about London? And they called for my wife and she came out um, with a sweater on and the t-shirt underneath she was wearing was one of those tourist city tourist buses with the top cut off, those open top buses. Mm -hmm, right. And it was red, a double decker, and it said, I've been on top. So she showed Mrs. P, the general's wife, her I've been on top t shirt. <laughs> what a great <laughs> situation of planned happenstance. Right. And then um she she um she knew what was happening with the planned happenstance um concept if you will and got talking with her because she'd spent a lot of time over there and um remember this is pre-internet for mm -hmm. you know us and uh so we agree she called she had mrs p call me at home and during that call i have to say i had a bit of a moment and i said you introduce yourself as mrs p and um you know i get that just is that is that a nickname like mr c cunningham on the happy days and she she gave me one of those sympathetic laughs and said no no p e a y i'm mrs p the general's wife and i was like oh <laughs> oh okay um yes ma'am how can i help you and right so shared information about the uk with her and we actually um wrote and phoned National Trust and other places, London Tourist, and they mailed us in the snail mail some some products uh, that we then turned over to Mrs. P. And during what we thought would be the last meeting, we said, why not? The word, why not present her with a letter, a recommendation, one of these folders where on one side it shows what I've been doing, above my pay grade and um, a little bit of a resume with my GPA and those things and my um, scores and my volunteer work. And on the other side, a draft letter of recommendation. And you always somehow manage to get it on their letterhead. 
um, uh, <laughs> wow. and um, the three by five, you know, the three point, the three and a half inch floppy disk. And I said, "Ma'am, if this is if this is um, inappropriate, let me know and uh, have a wonderful time in England." And uh, but I was wondering if your husband, the four star general who was in command of Central Command at the time. Um, he did take over from Storm and Norman um, Schwarzkopf. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at this package, because I'm trying to get into officer training school so I can get a commission and ultimately someday get the PhD, yada, yada, and be, become a psychologist. And she she giggled a little bit and she said, yes. And I fell out of my seat and uh, because you just never know. And she took it and... Time was ticking, time was ticking. And then later on, um, I don't know if any of you listeners have been to MacDill Air Force Base Commissary, but there's about 40 checkouts back in those days. It was huge. Right. Still and is. So I, I don't know if they've been there, but I was just there earlier this year. And as you said, if I remember correctly, MacDill is head of U.S. Central Command, right? U.S. Central Command headquarters and U.S. Special Operations Command headquarters. So you can imagine this is an enormous base. Right. And a lot of snowbirds love to go down there in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Be oh, my goodness. Beautiful <laughs> housing on that base. Beautiful golf course. Yep. It was really you didn't even know you were on an Air Force base much of the time. Exactly. No. And back then there were no jets. There It was Club McDill. It was in between <laughs> the six F-16s had left. And then later on, they got a refueling mission. So it was Club McDill. <laughs> yeah. um, many many high level decisions made on the golf courses out there um and so in the no man's land between the um uh, cash registers and the end caps of the aisles where they would normally have the seasonal displays there was nothing i don't know what was going on but my wife and i walk in we got our tie dyes on cut off jean shorts and sandals and in walks mrs p with her master sergeant e7 or e8 um for lack of a better term butler who um aid they and she walks right up to us and we're in no man's land and gives us massive hugs and says hey how you doing and it went dead silent up there you could have heard a pin drop and we're like that yeah great everything's fine how was england oh we loved it blah 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 it was wonderful hey did my husband get you that letter yet and i was like no no that's okay that's fine i've I do have another one in my back pocket I can use. I'm sure he's pretty busy being in charge of the whole Middle East and all. Um, <laughs> and this was, this would have been 95, um, 95, 96. Yeah. And, um, and so, oh, okay, well, have a nice day. And uh, the other letter I had was from an E8, not quite the same as an O10, but, you know, it was it was my food superintendent. Right, an, e, an E8 compared to a four star general is a <laughs> little bit of a difference, right? And then a few days later, I'm cooking on the grill, and uh, um, the the NCOIC of the um, dining hall, the tech sergeant E6 says, "Tansley, why is there a lieutenant colonel calling us from CENTCOM to speak to you?" And I said, I don't, yes, I know. <laughs> Let me get the phone. And um, I virtually reported in as, you know, Edmund Tansley reports as ordered. Um, and he's like, yes, yeah, there's Lieutenant Colonel Coffee Maker. That's the name I gave him. Um, <laughs> making fun of his duties, you know, um, being, a, being a general's aide kind of thing. Um, yeah, how soon can you get to Central Command? We've got a letter from the general for you. And I said, 10 minutes, because I had to get out of my my dining hall Smurf suit and into my BDUs at the time mm -hmm. and ride my bicycle over there. And yeah, 10 minutes later, I had the general's letter in hand. And uh, and that kind of sealed the deal with uh, that was very helpful, to say the least, with getting into officer training school. As in very helpful, I guess a four star <laughs> general's letter of recommendation is probably a slam dunk to get into OTS, correct? Well, yeah, many I, I displayed it. I made I made color photocopies of the letter, kept the original, and um, and you know framed that. And I've had that up in my office. It's not here. Um, mm -hmm. It's in a box somewhere. But uh, 
when I'd see army people, they would look at it and say, wow, that's pretty much the same as getting an award. Yeah. You know, yeah. like a, yeah. a medal. Sure. Uh, and, and I mean, what an amazing story of, of preparation, planned happenstance, positive, you know, positive uncertainty mm -hmm. and just just going for it. Right. Having yes. an opportunity and taking it and, and going for it unabashedly. Yep, done that a few times. Um, I mean, you can steer the ship, but I, I have another story at the tip of my tongue. If Let's hear it. You know. Okay, so I was in training. I was in the Air National Guard and um, over in uh, upstate New York, and I was a second, first lieutenant, and then I put, there was a deadline to go to a professional education school that captains go to. And the deadline had passed in November. It ended uh, the beginning of November. I put on captain in the beginning of February. And I put my package together to go to that school. And I handed it to my boss. And he was the wing commander. And I said, look, humor me. I really want to go to the school because I'm in grad school during the other times of the year and summertime is my opportunity to get this um, education for captains and he's like yeah sure whatever and he threw it up to national guard bureau and they got all excited because culturally in that at that time at the air national guard and this was 2000 to 2004 so this would have been mm, mm, 01 01 Sure, why not? Yes, 2001. Um, the, the normal for them was to go at the last minute. And here was this brand new captain wanting to go mm -hmm. and just to get it in timing with my schooling. And he was like, yep. And National Guard Bureau and National Guard Bureau got all excited and sent out a captain wide or an officer wide email saying, if any of you are eligible to go to its SOS, Squadron Officer School, um, we have plenty of seats. You know, I was literally able to pick the date and time that I wanted to go for the five-week course uh, because no one would go to them unless they had to. Um, but on active duty, where I came from and where I knew I was going back to, to be selected to go to those schools was highly competitive. So to have that under my belt was was not too shabby and right. so i ended up going and um and then after during that time there was a, a there was another course i wanted to get to but hadn't managed to get into which was the personnel officer course that was my career field course mm -hmm. um And um, no, that that's that that was a different summer. That was two thousand two. That was SOS. Sorry, two thousand one was SOS. Now two thousand two, um, I went to DOMI Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute, which is uh, my training to become a discrimination um, complaint manager, manager and and um, equal opportunity, basically. And that was in Cocoa Beach. That was rough. Three yeah, months, you know. Terrible assignment, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, and during that course, we found out that a lady who was going to go to the personnel officer course down in Keesler in Biloxi, Mississippi, had to go home to her home unit because of some shenanigans happened. So I knew there was a seat available physically. I wasn't on the books paperwork wise. Um, fortunately, we had friends down there in Biloxi who were stationed there. And my wife and I and five-month-old looked at each other and we said, let's go. And so we went down there. On the Friday, I graduated the one school, drove down there, told them we were coming. They were cool about it. And then Monday, I walk into the uh, the next school in my service dress, looking pretty, you know, looking professional with my resume and my story. And I said, look, I know this doesn't happen every day. I know this may even be inappropriate, but um, here's my situation, grad school, yada, yada. I know there's empty seats in this class. I would like your empty seat, please. I just got distinguished graduate out of um, the Cocoa Beach School. I'm sure I could do the same here. Little, little sell it. salesmanship doesn't hurt. A little bit, and, yeah. um, You know, confidence. Um, 
And the the NCO that was there grumbled a lot, made some phone calls to um, National Guard Bureau again, and they did what they call force gained me. They forced me into a seat um, after the fact. And so I got in the seat, had a great five weeks or whatever it was, and was distinguished graduate. And uh, so that made National Guard Bureau and everybody in my chain of command happy. But I was able to get those difficult to get schools taken care of simply by showing up or putting in the package uh, four months after it closed. Um, you never know. We assume, we right. assume failure. We assume it won't happen. Oh, who am I compared to them? Well, my perspective is just another person. Everybody is another person. We're all at different places on our paths. And what's the worst that could happen? They could say no. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And press on and go to plan B or C or whatever. Yeah. Well, and in the end, at least, you know, you tried. And if it works out, look what you get from it. And if it doesn't, as you said, you go on to plan LMNOP, whatever it might be. Yeah. I'd, I'd yeah. like to talk a little bit now. The, the reason, let's see, we met through the great Terry Fossum, the uh, yes. formerly the world's most interesting man. Um, I know he doesn't want to go by that anymore, but uh <laughs> And and you wrote a, you you wrote a, a review of his book, I believe, on the idea of of your understanding of prospect theory and just how um, right. psychologically sound his book, The Oxcart Technique, is. Can you talk a little bit about prospect theory because that was something he introduced me to, and as I dive right. deeper into it, it's it is fascinating. Absolutely. Um, would you like me to say how we met? Or absolutely, just, absolutely. Okay. So again. Planned happenstance, coincidence, synchronicity, call it what you will. Um, it just so happened that a mutual friend of ours who we knew through scouting and also I used to be stationed with in England, um, he just, he knew I was a psychologist and um, he forwarded Terry's uh email or message saying hey do you know anyone that knows anything about prospect theory um and he forwarded it to, to me um because he wants someone to take a look at his book the oxcart technique um and you know possibly help him to kind of validate that it is based in sound theory research and um and so i was like yeah sure i'll, I'll take a look i mean i could have said no but that would be silly um, when a best-selling author is asking, you know, some random dude about this, and I just so happen to use prospect theory and other relevant theories in my dissertation. Um, I, just, I like how you say, I just happened to use that same theory in my dissertation, <laughs> right? Like, again, this idea of planned happenstance, when, when, when you take the opportunity to connect with other people, it's amazing what kind of synchronicity comes up. Oh, yeah. Coincidence doesn't exist in my vocabulary. That went out years ago, you know, and there's, there's the, I like that. I love the saying, um, yesterday, we called it coincidence. Today, we call it synchronicity. Tomorrow, we call it skill. Mm. Because, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. And if you're aware and mindful, and it's not anything that's beyond anybody's capability and reach, it's focus. You know, people think about Einstein and rock stars and, and I don't know, Schrodinger, I love physics, or Gandhi or whomever. They just had quite the focus and they, they were true to themselves and true to their vision and they did it. That's no yeah. different to any of us, you know, barring any inabilities, of course, but don't talk yourself out of anything until you've tried a lot. Um, but... Yeah, so Terry and I talked, we met a couple of times and um, virtually, and he asked me to um, read through his book just, just to see if it fit with the um, prospect theory. And um, absolutely it does. It fits with a few different theories, um, which is, uh, you know, I, I, 
I would give him feedback, uh, you know, every couple of days, I would read a few chapters, give him feedback on specifics, even I, I even got down into, oh, I think there's an extra space here in the in the format and whatnot, you know, that's just me, yeah. all those evaluations and decorations and recommendations I've done for other people, I just get into that mode. Um, and uh, so he, he really liked that. And, and then he said, um well let me just ask my uh my guy as he referred to him see if he wants you to do the uh um forward and i was mm -hmm. like o -o -o okay yeah i'm not gonna say no of course i had that i had that internal moment of panic sure. it's like who, who am i to write this guy's forward for the hard copy well i'm a guy who happens to be an expert in these fields <laughs> you know, less famous, uh, less time on TV and all the rest. Um, but, you know, so what? Right. So, um, right. and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll figure it out. And um, so word came back, go for it, you know, mm -hmm. however many pages, six to 10 pages or whatever, and uh, and then references, etc. cetera. And it, I got stuck in, I started reading articles again and refreshing my mind and um I learned a lot actually from articles terry sent um along the way about prospect theory um and how it also fit nicely with the way he's written his book mm -hmm. um basically you know, to get into the, the the theory the different theories that um you know he's he's tapped into unwittingly um right. you know because he's he's not a psychologist he's not a psychology researcher and um, with prospect theory, it was actually um, developed by two psychologists um, who later on were given a Nobel Prize for economics. Um, it was developed, I think, maybe even, in the, I don't remember if it was in 70, late 79 or something like that, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, but uh they got the Nobel Prize. One had passed away, like in 2012, I think, um, because the basic premise of prospect theory is how something is worded, how a message is framed, be it positively or negatively or neutral, will have a greater effect on people dependent on the on what if the outcome is known for what they're trying to convince the people to do, or if the outcome is unknown. Mm -hmm. So for example, an, a known outcome could be, well, if you don't brush your teeth, you know, it's going to be, you know, it would be not brushing your teeth or not securing the baby seat to the car. We know what's going to happen if they have to stop suddenly or you don't brush your teeth for a month or so. So those messages were found to be more powerful in getting people to actually engage in those kinds of behaviors when they were framed in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. For example, you brush your teeth, they'll be nice and clean and healthy, or you strap your kid's baby seat into the car, it will be safe. Now in situations where the outcome was unknown or much less likely to be predicted, such as career development, college progress, or um, some of the original research was looking at self-examinations for cancer, so breasts, testicles, that kind of thing. We don't know what's going to happen when we exam, but in order to, for the medical community, say, to help people, encourage them to do these examinations without, with the unknown, with the uncertainty for an outcome, they would use, um, they found that the negatively framed messages are more powerful. For example, if you don't examine yourself, you could get cancer and not know it. You could die. Or with a college student, you know, if you don't be proactive in your career development, you won't go anywhere because there's unknowns. You know, we, people change majors. People, the average American changes careers eight times in their lives, you know? And uh, so 
the negative, the positive framed message works better with known outcomes. The negative framed message works better with um, unknown outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so that became heaven for marketing. Um, That's exactly what it sounds like. It's very sound marketing yeah. theory. Yeah, exactly. And hence the Nobel Prize later on. It just was amazing. So Terry had been using both, actually, and he had found during our time chatting when I was working on his book, um, articles, recent articles that say it's good to use both because you really don't know where the audience is at. And so using, like in Terry's book, um, the Oxcart technique, he does use both because he's appealing to an unknown audience. He doesn't know if people are in the midst, midst of uncertainty or they're about to, you know, they're about to go for it. But, you know, the book makes that, that, that message is that extra nudge, that extra push that puts them from theory to action. And there's a huge Grand Canyon between theory and action, you know, as the road to hell being paved with good intentions. Um, well, and I think that's the great thing about Terry's book is it takes theory and he just he tells great stories and, and shares great case examples that takes that theory, that difficult information mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. and makes it so actionable. Absolutely. And and he uses um, other theories that weren't asked about, um, but uh, were part of my dissertation and publication were Albert Bandura's social cognitive learning theory. Mm -hmm. Um and he he talks about um, the the things that the variables that help us become more confident or less confident where doing the thing you want to be confident in helps us be more confident in it because we're doing it. Um, vicarious um, learning, seeing other people do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's telling those stories of other people. Terry is telling the stories of other people's success. And struggles and terry's own story and mm -hmm. mine mm -hmm. and yours <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um then there's um uh verbal persuasion which is the cheerleading hey man you got this you can do this you know go for it and then the one that has a negative effect on um, one's confidence to do something is anxiety which is why i've learned and my work with my clients is oh no we like to avoid that in our culture we like to avoid discomfort but the best way to get through that discomfort is not running away is to lean into it right. learn I'll, about it gain that wisdom practice the practices and transcend that stuff right I, I like to say the best way you know through anxiety is through it you've got to go exactly. through it and conquer it yep. uh, you've got to find out how to blow that kiss to that helicopter so right, that you can right. continue on the back nine. And exactly. And um, I, I tell everybody the treatment of choice for anxiety or phobias is do that which you fear. Mm -hmm. But doing it in a controlled stepwise manner to where you're not freaking yourself out. And if you're scared of snakes, you're just jumping in a pit of snakes unless you're into that sort of thing. You do it slowly but surely. And, you know. You're welcome to chat with me if you have any questions about any of that. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, the other theory that um, I used for my dissertation, keep saying that publication, whatever, um, that Terry was unaware of, but he uses throughout because right from the get go, he's an ordinary guy from a low, low economic status town who right before his dad died or right, he was told by another adult, his your kids are going to go nowhere. Your boys are not going to go anywhere. Forget it. No. and well to that they, they seem to have done quite all right um and and uh which is another thing ignore the naysayers and yep. uh um so he presents himself as he is as an ordinary guy who's made an effort has had a focus and has persisted you know people say you know if you fall try try again I like to say if I fall 8,000 times, I'm getting up 8,001 and two and three and four because never give up, you know? Right. Um, and then there's the, the, and the fact that he portrays himself as an ordinary guy who happens to have 
created and made and happened upon and therefore jumped onto these 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 opportunities for success um and i know everybody defines that differently and everybody that listens has different circumstances and situations so tailor those words to your own um the elaboration likelihood model is one that says mm -hmm. in short it's uh, similarity breeds trust mm -hmm. so the imagine um like i myself in my work i'm a working class lad in a white collar job and i've been in the poop i've i've been in you know i've been to iraq i've been to afghanistan um i wasn't kicking in doors but i certainly you know i i, I say i've seen more than some and far less than many others and you know i've been to the main hospital at balad in iraq and other places in afghanistan that are quite unsavory um so yeah never seen generals throw so many purple hearts around uh, in my life at the wow. in the icu in the e emergency room but um so you know anyone who's listening what do you think of when you say psychologist oh, or doctor or lawyer or no you know someone with some with the qualifications all right I know from my perspective, um, it would be silver platter, lifestyle was relatively easy. Um, you know, my stereotypical automatic thinking is, oh yeah, they just walked the walk and talked the talk and went from college to college to college. And um, so in order for Terry and people like myself, who dropped out of school at 14, who had a messy family divorced who had a messy upbringing and um lots of alcohol just a mess just um yeah lots of bad stuff um more to come on that in my book which maybe you know soon someday um it's it's outlined <laughs> um elaboration likelihood model similarity breeds trust if i were to walk around in a white coat with a clipboard you're going to think one thing of me but if in my opening spiel when i'm talking to my new clients for the first time i'm talking about confidentiality i'm talking about suicidality homicidality doing all the policy stuff and i say look be yourself in here i try to make this as comfortable for you as possible that means that if swearing is normal for you have at it it's normal for me and um if offensive stuff is normal for you great if it's not great i'll meet you where you're at um or at least do my best you know because i am um i could embarrass a sailor on the best of days you know <laughs> <laughs> no offense to sailors if anyone's getting offended but uh um yeah so um the elaboration likelihood model people are going to be more likely to listen to somebody if they're similar if they seem knowledgeable educated in what they're doing and they seem trustworthy um and so again for different people that's different things uh i i tend to stick to my roots of you know working class lad and a white collar job um and uh that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, well, I, I can see how elaboration likelihood model can combine with prospect theory, right? We we yeah. want to have that similarity and we want to give the message. But in the end, as you said, you still have to be yourself and mm -hmm. you know, embarrass those sailors if they need it. I know there are a few that do listen. So, <laughs> But uh, then I know we're getting short on time and you've got sure. a big day ahead of you and, and as do I. Uh, once that book gets written or already beforehand, we're going to have to have you back on because that was a delightful conversation. Awesome. And again, I'm... we've barely covered, you know, the first half <laughs> of your uh, the first page <laughs> of your CV. And uh, <laughs> again, it's it's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, that was yeah, a oh, great conversation. Honor. And uh, my... I, I certainly will bring you back uh, hopefully soon yeah. because we have so much more to cover, including the upcoming book. Absolutely. And so how would if people wanted to reach out to me, how does that work typically? What's the best way for them to find you? Do you, do you... Um, my name at hotmail.com, Dennis hotmail .com? Tansley. 
Yeah, you have that email address, right? Absolutely. I don't know if you, That's if how we connected. And so, yeah, people yeah. want to talk to Dennis and find out more about all of these amazing theories. You just hop on, uh, you know, we'll have that in the show notes and you can contact me and I'll put you right through to Dennis. And uh, Sweet. Awesome. Again, a pleasure. And, and, and we'll talk again uh, again soon, Dennis. You take care. You too. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it.